Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press, the segment where we take a look at the stories making the headlines on our national dailies. Um, let's say hello to our guest, the public affairs analyst, Mr. Femi Lawson. Good morning, Mr. Lawson. Good morning, the PLOS TV Thank you for joining us. Let's begin with the daily independent newspaper. Um, the headline reads, Condemnation trails Buhari's request to borrow $4 billion dollars. 710 million euros. Experts, PDP, say fresh loans will deepen economic crisis. Above that headline, Edo prohibits unvaccinated persons from entering government offices. Buhari says 1.6 million households, 8 million Nigerians benefit from CCT. CBN to establish International Finance Center. Below the headlines on the Daily Independent, IPOB, IPOB, wants impersonators, as Southeast is locked down again. Hush puppy. Buhari will have final say over Abakiari's fate. That's according to the minister. Says police affairs ministry yet to hear from president on Magu. Buhari seeks stiffer control against small arms and light weapons. Asu warns FG pushing it beyond limits. UAE names six Nigerians as Boko Haram financiers. Nigeria's spending on e-commerce hits $13 billion per annum. Lastly, on the Daily Independent, e-transmission of results. Listen to Nigerians, PDP governors charge National Assembly. And now on the Punch newspapers. Big story there says, experts and others carpet National Assembly as Buhari plans $4 billion, 710 million euros borrowings. Loans will reduce poverty, says the president. Public debts rose from 12.12 trillion naira in June 2015 to 33.11 trillion naira in March 2021. Perpetual borrowing, lawmakers working against Nigerians' interests, will account for their actions, says a group. Also on the punch, VAT battle shifts to Supreme Court as Rivers challenges order. Rising unemployment can wipe out Nigeria and elite, or can wipe out Nigeria, elite, unsafe, says Ingege. Looming strike, hold federal government responsible, as who tells parents. We can also find on the punch, indigenous nationalities protest at the UN, one against Nigeria's disintegration. And on Kogi prison attack, GGC threatens fleeing inmates with prosecution. Sit at home, hurts in southeast, Umahi, Obi, lament, um, and violence in Anambra and Enugu. 60 landlords desert houses as flood overwhelms Ogun community. And uh, also, Fire Shame may join PDP national chairmanship race. These are the big stories on The Punch uh, this morning. We see similar stories on the Nigerian Tribune, still about the president seeking approval for fresh $4 billion loan and 710 million uh, euros loan. The president, the APC, selling Nigeria, says PDP. IPOP bows to pressure, cancels sit-at-home order. COVID-19, Edo begins enforcement of restriction for unvaccinated persons. Ogo joins VAT war, bill passes second reading at assembly. Amoteku arrest herder for um, arrest herder 180 cows for flouting anti-open grazing law. But Jabia Mila endorses Sonwolu for second term. Southern governors meet in Enugu tomorrow. Amcon AIG's CPs to support debt recovery drive. CBN to launch 15 trillion naira infrastructure fund in October. Kogi jailbreak 114 out of 266 fleeing inmates recaptured. Unibend students block highway over 20,000 Naira late registration fee. And on the This Day newspapers, Buhari rallies banking sector support to lift Nigerians out of poverty. 15 trillion Naira infra core ready in October, says Amefiele. A CBN floats Nigerian International Financial Center. Also um, on the This Day, on value-added tax, Wiki goes to Supreme Court's one stay of execution nullified. <coughs> 
President seeks Senate's approval for $4.179 billion and 710 million euros external loans. The PDP says Buhari and APC sell in Nigeria, urges National Assembly, Assembly probe. And uh, ex Unilai Council member seeks trial of VC for breach of procurement law. Good morning once again to Femi Lawson. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. All right. Um, I think the most popular story this morning is the uh, loan that the president is once again seeking, $4 billion and 710 million euros. Um, what's your reaction to this? We must understand that these uh, borrowing that the president has been pushing the request to the National Assembly, you know, in successive manner, is such that has become inevitable because if you followed the process of the making of the 2021 Appropriation Act, you understand that it has been explicitly stated by the president when presenting that budget that the source of funding of this budget, you know, under most of the headings, are going to be coming from external borrowing. So today, I think what the president is doing is just the inevitable, even though it is very unfortunate that we have to continue to live on debt as a nation, that we have to continue to use the greater part of our annual budget to service debt. I think Nigerian people, particularly the opposition party, that are not making you know, noise about this request by president, should have understood that it is not starting by now. There is a foundation. What role did they play when the president brought budget to the National Assembly and emphasize that this budget is going to be funded through external borrowing. Have we also forgotten that when these requests are going to be presented on the floor of the National Assembly, members of the opposition parties who are legislators are always present to give ratification to some of these requests. So I think the PDP in particular must go beyond many issue press releases and become serious as, a, as an opposition in terms of policy, you know, and critical analysis of government, you know, programs, particularly the making of the, the budget, which is affecting all of us. Well, it's very unfortunate that the country is so much immersed in debt to the extent that not even the generation that's currently borrowing will be able to pay this by the time it is over. Yeah, well, um, but Mr. Lawson, is it important to also um, question... Uh, how well we have used the loans that we've taken in the last uh, six years. Because we, we moved from 12 trillion to 33 trillion Naira um, uh, debt in, you know, four, in five or six years. So is it important to question how well we've used these loans and also, you know, maybe also encourage government to look out for other ways that we can save fund, uh, funds in Nigeria? Loans cannot be the only source of income to fund Nigeria's budget. Uh, do, don't you think, Mr. Lawson? You, you, you see, our penchant for taking loans, like we are currently doing, is a direct reflection of the unproductivity that, you know, that has characterized governance in Nigeria. Not only the federal government. There's hardly any state in Nigeria today that is not indebted either locally or also to foreign lenders. Lender. And what does this imply? It implies that our states, the federal government, are no longer productive for a country that is so blessed with human and natural resources to rely so much on extra borrowing, to run government, to fund its programs, shows that we are not productive. And there is no way this country can be productive or our states can escape this burden of death until we begin to look at restructuring this country, we have continued to emphasize on this. Some states in Nigeria have no reason to be poor. Some states in Nigeria have no reason to borrow. But because they are not productive, because the system has also crippled and incapacitated them, they have no other option than to keep borrowing to run government and to service the state. Quite unfortunate also is the fact that majority of these borrowings do not go into capital development, capital projects. A lot, is, a lot of our spendings, three goals on recurrence, mostly to service, you know, political office holders in Nigeria. At the detriment 
or developmental project that will impact on the life of the ordinary people. That is the irony of it. Mr. Femi Lawson, when we take a look at the papers this morning, we see a story regarding IPOB. It's on the Daily Independent. It says IPOB wants impersonators as South East is locked down again. And when we go to the Nigerian Tribune, just above the headline, we see the story, IPOP bows to pressure, cancel sit-at-home order. Now, when we took a closer look at the story, we saw that, you know, IPOP spokesman came out to say that from September 14th, there was no longer a sit-at-home order in the Southeast. It's effectively cancelled. They went ahead to condemn all the atrocities that have been carried out by people who claim to be members of IPOB. Um, the recent uh, motorcycles, um, the recent incident of motorcycles being burnt in Imo State, they condemned that and said they were going to replace those motorcycles and rebuild the blocks of classrooms that were destroyed. You know, they just went on and on, and it seemed like they had turned a new leaf saying that IPOB was a responsible organization that would only sit at home on the days when their leader, Ennam Dikanu, um, would be having court appearances. So what do you think might be responsible for this change of heart? Would you say it's a combination of efforts of, you know, an outcry of Nigerians? Um, would you say, you know, like Emmanuel Powerful said, it's because of the impact, the economic impact on the Southeast. Would you say it's the governors, the Ohanese in Digo, or the president's visit? It's not a way I is uh, the reality, considering the fact that the, late, the, recent, the latest statement is not the first, you know, from IPOB, you know, suspending the sit at home order. You know, there has been an earlier directive that the sit at home order be, you know, be suspended. But the unfortunate situation is that criminal elements within the Southeast have exploited the sit at home order to unleash violence, to assault people, and to maim innocent people under the guise of enforcing the seats at home order. The seats at home order, for the avoidance of doubt, is a civil form of protest by people to express their displeasure to whatever policy or whatever happening around them. And what does it mean to sit at home? It's a voluntary action. It is left for those who choose to sit at home to sit, and those who want to express their constitutional right of free movement to also do. But when you get to the point where non-state actors, militia, are beginning to enforce what ordinarily should be a civil action, then that must be treated purely as a criminal you know, offense. It is impressive that the governors of the Southeast and stakeholders are rising up to speak against this you know, evil. It is it is very clear that some elements are out you know, to, 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 to sabotage the, you know, the IPOB you know, agenda. The IPOB, of course, has been known to organize itself, especially when its leader, Inam Bikano, was around. But that nonetheless, the IPOB must not allow these criminal elements to sabotage its, its agitation otherwise. Everything that he has, it has demanded for all this while it has agitated for will be swept under the drain. IPOB has to be very careful at this point in time. There must be a clear cut defined leadership, even in the absence of Inan Dikaru, because it looks like all sorts of characters must speak for IPOB because of the absence of their leader. So IPOB also has a responsibility to have a clearly defined leadership that will give others and all some of these things that they are doing, not just, you know, a gang of criminals operating as IPOB, you know, and, you know, assaulting people, destroying people's property, stopping children from writing examinations. It is right. time IPOB come out with an alternative leadership that will be speaking and representing, you know, its voice. Okay, uh, Mr. Lawson, let's now also talk about the value-added tax debate as uh, the River State government seems to be moving to the Supreme Court uh, to, uh, uh, of course, get um, a favorable ruling, if possible. Uh, how do you see this playing out? Well, it's important that uh, we do not see this as a River State issue anymore, even though Governor Wiki has led you know, the crusade for some of, for what, for what some of us see as a rising and a very big part towards restructuring this country. Only yesterday, the bill 
you know, for on VAT also scaled you know, second reading in the State House of Assembly. Yes. And I can assure you that more and more states, not only in the South, even in the North, will join you know, this litigation by the FIRS against the state government, you know, and others who have now shown interest. It is time for us to begin to really define some of these dictates of our constitution that have been abused, that have been misinterpreted by operatives of the successive administration in Nigeria. We must understand that it is not this administration of President Buhari that took over the collection of tax, a vast from states. It has been there, but it is good that a state is coming to correct this impression. And Governor Wike is doing the right thing by ensuring that adequate judicial interpretation is given to the issue of VAT, especially the ruling of the Federal High Court in Port Harcourt, which gave the power to collect you know, VAT to, to states. So I think it's the right step. And I think more states should be interested in what the Governor Wike is currently championing on the VAT. Yeah, but, okay. um, just to quickly add to that, is there any other way around this? Do you think the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal in any way can interpret the Constitution different? Or the FIRS well, well, still has, you know, something to fight for? No, well, it is within the right of the FIRS to continue to, you know, fight for the retention of its power to collect the VAT. But the truth is that it is also the exclusive preserve of the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution of the Federal Republic. The Constitution has given the Supreme Court that power, and I think the Supreme Court is the appropriate authority that will do the interpretation as, uh, as regards the power of states and what categories of taxes are states empowered to collect in Nigeria. So I think the FIRS, FIRS has not also shown any posture of willing to engage these states on this tax issue. So I think the best thing to, have, to be done is, of course, to approach the Supreme Court. Mr. Larson, um, finally from me, um, there's a story on the Daily Independence just um, at the bottom left that reads, UAE names six Nigerians as Boko Haram financiers. Um, we've heard statements from the UAE, um, you know, even last year, that he knows someone in government, you know, that was a member of the Boko Haram um, financiers list. And now it's named um, about 38 people and about 15 um, agencies, and amongst them is six Nigerians. Um, what do you expect the UAE and the Nigerian government to do with this information? What I think the Nigerian government must do at this point in time is to consolidate on what the UAE government has done by exposing locally people who have been identified as sponsors of Boko Haram and other insurgent groups in the country. We have intelligence organizations like the DSS, the NIA, DIA, all of them having records of how the activities of Boko Haram and some of these insurgent groups have been financed in the past. And I don't think it is right for government to continue to conceal the identity of these people, especially at a time that these insurgents are becoming more emboldened, more empowered, and more sophisticated, even for, our, for Nigerian forces to tackle. One of the best ways to tackle this menace of insurgency is to expose their sponsors, just like UAE is doing, just like United States has also promised to do, and we can begin to reduce you know, their sources there are sources of funding, you know, another empowerment that is giving them the leverage that they are so much enjoying in the country today. So I think the government of Nigeria must be sincere enough not only to get these six individuals that have been linked to sponsorship of insurgency, you know, probed and prosecuted, but also exposed more, including those that have been accused of being in government, you know, who are behind the sponsorship of Boko Haram and other insurgent groups. All right. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, Asu, once again, is uh, uh, talking about strike um, here in the country. And they say, you know, um, the federal government should be blamed um, if they eventually go back on strike. Um, Femi Lawson, from, do you think that the Nigerian government, you know, has failed in managing these crises here and there, including with the NARD? The, the Nigerian government has not been fair in the way it has been dealing with public education in the country. It is very unfortunate that we have 
a bunch of leaders whose children school abroad and are not in any way interested in the state of education in the country. Just like Asu said, and for some of us who have followed the dispute between us and federal government for over 10 years, you come to realize that federal government, according to Asu, have only been able to fulfill one of the major points of demand of ASU. And we must always understand that the demands of ASU are not just about the welfare of university teachers, but also the improvement on the, in the state of education on our campuses. And I think for any society that is willing to genuinely develop, that does not want to leave its future in debt like we are currently doing, such country must take education seriously. And our country is not taking this seriously. It is very unfortunate that we continue to have you no know, low budget appropriation, then fundamental issues that have to be addressed, like what has been raised by ASU, are not being addressed. And I think it is within the right of ASU as an industrial union to use that only tool it has, which is try, you know, to, 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 to make its demand. But I think the federal government should not allow ASU to go on another strike this time around, you know, before attending to some of these. Even if these demands cannot be met, you know, awesomely at all, I think there must be some seriousness and more has to be done than one of the points that have been addressed, you know, by the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Femi Lawson, Public Affairs Analyst. We appreciate your insights on Off the Press this morning. It's my pleasure. All right. So with us, uh, we're going to be going back in history next and sharing with you what happened on this day, 15th of September, many years ago. I'm going back to talk about the one of the famous names in boxing, Muhammad Ali, and uh, what he was able to achieve on this day. Mm. And I'm going back to the year 2020, just a year ago, to tell you about a landmark ruling regarding... Um, the death of Brianna Taylor. Stay with us.